some people believe is the burial shroud of Jesus. A forensically accurate imprint of the crucifixion, bearing Christ's image and stained with his blood. The only conclusion I can come to, this is the real thing. Others are just as certain it's not. The Shroud of Turin is the work of a confessed forger, period. Is it the real thing or a fake? Even modern science can't seem to find the definitive answer. It is either the most remarkable forgery of all time or something very, very remarkable happened 2,000 years ago. If it's a forgery, how was it done? And if it's the burial cloth of Jesus, does it confirm the faith or shatter it? over four meters long and one meter wide. The cloth isn't pretty to look at. It's been scarred, burned, stained and patched. But what makes it unusual is the image it bears on its surface. It's a shadow so faint it seems to disappear when you approach. At it from a distance, you can make out the ghostly silhouette of a man, seen from both the front the actual burial shroud of Jesus, or is it a fake? Every responsible and legitimate scientist who knows anything about the shroud accepts it as an as a artistic representation made during the 14th century. It is just out of character with uh, any art that one finds from the Middle Ages, Renaissance, anything like that. The shroud first came to light in the mid-14th century when it showed up at a small church in the French town of Lirey. If anyone knew where it came from, they never admitted it. New churches were actually, by canonical law, required at some point to have uh, relics. So we see entire churches being built uh, to house a crown of thorns or a, a holy shroud. Like the cross and the crown of thorns, Jesus' burial shroud was a familiar artifact to medieval Christians. All four Gospels mention it. The Bible tells us that after the crucifixion, Jesus was carried to a nearby tomb, where he was prepared for burial. told this was done according to Jewish custom, but the Bible doesn't say what that custom was, except that Jesus was covered with a linen cloth. The Bible also says that large amounts of aloe and myrrh were brought in to anoint the body. Then, two days after the crucifixion, came the transforming event that launched a new religion. Christians believe that on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. Although the Gospels never explicitly say this. They just tell us that the tomb was left empty except for one or more pieces of linen. Is it possible that the resurrection somehow produced an imprint on the burial cloth? Most of those who believe the shroud is authentic think the answer is yes. The simplest answer is generally the correct one. And in this case, frankly, the simplest answer is this cloth wrapped this man's body and it's a, an artifact of that event. 
If the Shroud of Turin is actually Christ's burial cloth, it must have gone underground for the next 13 centuries. Because the next time it was heard of, the Shroud had turned up in the hands of a French crusader, recently returned from the Holy Land. His family later gave it to the church in Marais. And the Shroud celebrity status from there. Pilgrims flock to Luray to gaze upon the mysterious image in amazement. Eventually, the shroud became so popular, it had to go on tour. At each stop, local clerics would hold it aloft to reverent crowds. Medieval artists who saw the shroud tried to copy it with very limited success. But not everyone at the time was convinced the shroud was genuine. Even the local bishop was skeptical, according to something called the Darcy Memorandum. The bishop's report to Pope Clement, dated 1389, tells about his predecessor having found the artist who had painted it, and that the forger was found and confessed. But this incident in the Shroud's history may have been a simple matter of ecclesiastical envy. seems to be a case of a bishop coming across this extraordinary relic and saying this cannot be authentic, only the highest princes own something like this. And so it's got to be um, a forgery. In any case, that's where the matter ended. The forger was never named and there was no explanation as to how he'd achieved his stunning results. This is unfortunate because to this day, no one can say with any assurance how the forger did it. Though there's no shortage of theories. Depending on which skeptic you talk to, the forger may have achieved his results by painting, either on linen or glass. He could have used a shallow kind of statue called a bas-relief. It's possible he used a corpse. Some theories even suggest that such forensic accuracy could only have been achieved by using a live body. Some researchers have suggested that the shroud might be a medieval photograph, perhaps one of Leonardo da Vinci's less publicized experiments. brings us to one of the Shroud's many unusual qualities. Something happens when you take a picture of it. The first person to notice this phenomenon was an Italian lawyer named Secundo. It looks like a white-haired and white-bearded old man. Well, was Jesus an albino? Was he a white bearded old guy? No. In the enhanced image, Shroud believers saw a host of telltale signs. The bruise under the eye. Dumbbell-shaped marks on the back and legs. Blood flows on the forearms and the small of the back. of blood on the wrist. 34 years later, more pictures were taken during the Shroud's popular exhibition in 1931. But it wasn't until 1978 that the Shroud was put to the ultimate test. An examination by two dozen mostly American researchers with a lot of fancy modern equipment. They call themselves the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or STURB. They would have the Shroud for five straight days to take their measurements and run their tests. Their task was to work out definitively how the image was formed. 
Sturp team gathered in Turin in October 1978. Barry Schwartz was the group's official photographer. When I was first asked to be a member of this team, my first response was, but I'm Jewish. Aside from the image, the most obvious marks on the shroud were a series of burns and patches, the result of a church fire in 1532. The shroud we see today is actually several different pieces of cloth. There's the original image-bearing linen shroud, the patches sewn on after the 1532 fire, and the Holland cloth attached as a backing to stabilize it. For five days, the Sturp team examined the shroud and then spent months studying the results before they came to their conclusion. The image is not a photograph, not a painting, not an artwork. Although most of Sturp's research was published in peer-reviewed journals, critics questioned the team's competence and their motives. They didn't know anything at all about art forgeries and pigments and so forth. I could see right from the newspaper reports that these people were all biased toward authenticity. Critics pointed to the one dissenting voice from the Sturp team. Dr. Walter McCrone, a renowned microscopist. Although he didn't go to Turin, McCrone was sent fiber samples gathered on tape, and he discovered something when he examined them. Red ochre pigment, and probably in a collagen tempera binder. And he quickly came to the conclusion that the image areas of the shroud were covered by millions of tiny red ochre pigment particles. In other words, paint. Macron concluded that the shroud was simply a medieval painting, probably done freehand. But shroud believers think Macron was mistaken. There's no paint or pigment in the areas of the image. The image is only on the surface of the fibrils, and it does not go very deep into the cloth. Shroud believers also claim that whatever small amount of paint there is on the shroud probably got there as the result of an accepted practice when creating replicas. Using a bas-relief along with a kind of drape and daub method of applying pigment. I would take a bas-relief, mold wet cloth to it, and then you take a dauber and some powdered pigment and rub it like you would rub a gravestone. It will hit the high points, making them dark, leaving the deep recesses white, and it automatically makes a quasi-negative image. This time, it's the shroud believers who aren't impressed. Many people have created images on linen. It's easy to make an image on linen, although Joe achieved a, an image that was a far cry from matching the chemical and physical properties of the Shroud of Turin. This is why my challenge is to any skeptic who wants to tell me this is a forgery, then just go ahead and make one that matches. And I'll walk away, and I'll never talk about it again. But what does it mean exactly to match the image on the shroud? Unfortunately, in the shroud debate, each side seems to be working with a different set of facts. The matter of blood is a case in point. You might think it would be easy enough for modern science to work out if there's any actual blood in the so-called blood stains, but apparently it's not. They conducted some 11 different tests. They tested for albumin, proteins, all sorts of different elements of blood and found chemically positive readings so that they could say, as a collective, these um, stains are blood. They took blood-stained threads from the cloth and heroically examined them to find any trace of blood. They tried everything. They couldn't find blood. But one shroud researcher who has no doubt there's blood on the shroud is retired forensic pathologist Fred Zugaby. Like many believers, Dr. Zugaby came to the shroud in a roundabout way. 
I actually studied the crucifixion uh, quite a few years before I came across the shroud. And I was really amazed at the information that the shroud was able to give in confirming much of what I had studied. Suckerby decided to approach the shroud as he would any other crime scene photo and ask what it revealed about the victim. Gospels give us a very specific description of the Passion of Christ. It started with a scourging and a crown of thorns. Then came the climb to Golgotha, carrying a cross. Finally, there was the crucifixion. These basic facts would have been available to anyone living in the Middle Ages. But there are some noticeable differences between the ways medieval artists portrayed Christ's passion and the way the shroud seems to. Medieval paintings usually show Christ being scourged with a common whip. But to Zugaby, the shroud reveals that Jesus was beaten with a special kind of Roman whip called a flagrum. The usual flagrum had three leather thongs. This is sort of the makeup of it. It was probably a much sturdier than this, with dumbbell bits of metal at each end. There are over 120 of these dumbbell-shaped marks on the man of the shroud, about right for the biblical count of 39 lashes. There's also a crucifixion along it. In medieval art, Jesus is always shown with nails driven through the palms of his hands. But the shroud seems to put them where today we think they belong, in the wrist, close to the median nerve. To Zugaby, this explains why there's no sign of the man's thumbs on the shroud. The reason that you don't see the thumbs on the hand is because when the median nerve is hit, the branching of that nerve, very, very accurate, or considering position, movements, and everything else. Fred Zugaby and others are right in claiming that the image on the Shroud of Turin is a forensically and historically accurate depiction of a Roman crucifixion. And the skeptics are also right that the Shroud is a forgery. Then an obvious question arises. How did the forger know things that other medieval artists apparently didn't know? Apparently this artist had studied Roman methods of torture and execution. And I believe that this artist had actually been to the Holy Land on the Crusades. He also probably studied crucifixion techniques. Nails in the wrists and so on. The corpse would then have been powdered with something capable of making an image. No one knows what that might have been, but finely ground hematite and rust have been suggested as possibilities. Variant on this scenario is the use of a live body to start with. The unfortunate model would have undergone an actual scourging and crucifixion, creating wounds and blood flows that were even more accurate and realistic. Then there's the bas-relief method, favored by many skeptics. You would moisten a piece of linen, push it on the bas-relief, fold it into all the depressions, and then using a dauber and just daubing it onto the linen pressed onto the bas-relief. The quality of such a bas-relief rubbing is evidently quite high. One of my fakes was once put out by the Associated Press at Easter time as the Shroud of Turin, and I privately chuckled over it. They look very much um, the same. Getting it to look right is one thing. Getting it to be right, chemistry, physics-wise, is a whole separate issue. And to date, 29 years, no one has even come close. Finally, it's been suggested that if a medieval forger wanted to achieve a quasi-photographic quality for his relic, 
he might have worked out a way to make a quasi-photograph. The forger could have soaked a piece of linen in a solution that contained light-sensitive chemicals, probably silver nitrate and salts of ammonia. He would then have prepared a bas-relief or a statue with all the requisite wounds. When he was finished, he would prop up the statue outside the room in the sun. Chemically prepared linen could then have been framed directly opposite the statue and an intervening wall with a small hole drilled through it. What would happen next would be 20th century magic in a 14th century studio. This primitive photographic device is known as a camera obscura. Camera from the Latin word for room. Visionary technique like this may seem a bit advanced for the 14th century, but some researchers have speculated that the shroud is actually the work of Leonardo da Vinci, who used his own face as the model for Christ. Yes, Leonardo da Vinci did it, yes, using a, a camera, a, lucid, a camera obscura or something, a pinhole camera. Yes, uh, this, is, this is nonsense. The shroud is documented in the historical record a full 100 years before the birth of Leonardo. Now, he was a good artist, but he wasn't that good. So it couldn't have been Leonardo. But in 1988 came the news that the Shroud of Turin was indisputably some kind of fake. Indisputably. Unless a usually reliable test had somehow got it wrong. In an apparently straightforward procedure, the tiny strip was divided up into three pieces. These were put into small metal canisters and sent along with some control samples to three independent laboratories. The objective was to determine the age of the shroud with a carbon-14 test. Six months later, the three labs announced the results with a stark definitive set of dates scrawled on a blackboard. The flax fibers from the shroud had grown during a 130-year period right in the middle of the Middle Ages. The debate was over. The shroud of Turin was a fake. Great sadness because I had really wanted, obviously, it to be a nice, clean result that uh, it would be first century. I was shocked at how this test could come out to be so dramatically off. I have to recognize it was the worst possible result uh, for me. It's as if the world threw away all the good information and kept this one test and threw away the 99. But there was one piece of evidence that gave Shroud believers a tiny ray of hope that the carbon-14 date was off, even if only marginally. It came in the form of something called the Hungarian Prey Codex. This was a manuscript illustrating the burial of Christ, who was being wrapped in a long piece of cloth. Two things are interesting about the Prey Codex the cloth and the dates the codex was illustrated. The carbon dating said that the earliest possible date for the shroud was 1260. Hungarian prey manuscript was eliminated in 1190, some 70 years earlier. The artist who illustrated the prey manuscript gave Christ's burial cloth two distinctive features, a rare herringbone weave and four holes forming the rough shape of the letter L. The Shroud of Turin has the same two features. This 
suggest that whoever illustrated the Prey manuscript was familiar with the Shroud. Nearly a century before the C-14 test said it was created by a medieval forger. So right off the bat, that sort of disputes the carbon date. Perhaps, but probably not by 14 centuries. It's also possible that the forger had seen the Prey Codex in Hungary, maybe on his way back from the... Um, and also quite loosely. The experimental cloth is put in a jar with an inch of water at the bottom and tilted slightly. The resulting water stains on the experimental cloth match the ones on the shroud. But the intriguing point here is the container. Jars like these were used in the first century to store valuables, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. By the Middle Ages, people were using boxes and chests. that believers say point towards the Shroud's authenticity include the footprint that contains particles of dirt and limestone, consistent with Jerusalem. The Shroud's very rare stitching style, unknown in the Middle Ages, but used in Judea in the first century. And the fact that the linen was woven on an oversized loom common in the Middle East during the first century, but rare in France during the Middle Ages. For Shroud believers, all these anomalies offered interesting lines of research. But if the carbon dating was correct, they were also irrelevant. The question had to be asked. Was it possible that carbon dating was wrong? I predicted, after the date was revealed, that it wouldn't be long before they came up for ways to say that the date was incorrect. And sure enough, there have been literally dozens of ways suggested why this radiocarbon date cannot possibly be true. Uh, the debate over what might or might not have gone wrong with the C-14 tests is intensely technical and won't be over anytime soon. But there's yet another possibility, one proposed by two German writers in a controversial book. They think the carbon-14 tests were accurate, but they have nothing at all to do with the Shroud of Turin. He thinks these blood flows are a telltale forensic sign of Jesus' true condition after the crucifixion. A dead body simply cannot bleed the way we see it on the shroud. Kirsten believes that when Jesus was taken off the cross and carried to the nearby tomb, he was still alive, and that the cloth he was wrapped in provides irrefutable forensic proof. In his book, The Jesus Conspiracy, Holger Kirsten postulates the controversial theory that Jesus was the beneficiary of a plan to save his life. His family originally came from Arimathea. But why would Joseph buy a new tomb that no one had ever been buried in? Kirsten believes the tomb was purchased so that a plan to save Jesus' life could be carried out. His argument begins with the unusually short amount of time Jesus spent on the cross. It's strange that only three hours after he stopped showing any signs of life, he was taken off the cross. When we have reports of people who spent five days on a cross and survived. The Gospels report that Jesus resigned his spirit immediately after a sponge soaked in something bitter, usually mistranslated as vinegar, was passed to his lips. Es ist also sehr wahrscheinlich anzunehmen, dass in dem Getränk it's very likely that the drink passed up to him contained some kind of anesthetic. A centurion poked Jesus with a spear. 
Dieser Mann wird wenige Monate Only a few months later, this man became a Christian bishop in Cappadocia. That seems peculiar, to say the least. The spear brought forth a trickle of blood and water, but there was no other reaction. Jesus was presumed dead. Joseph of Arimathea then asked Pontius Pilate for the release of the body. Pilate agreed after expressing surprise that Jesus was already dead. Joseph had the body brought to the nearby tomb, not to be buried, but healed. The medicine they planned on using was aloe and myrrh. Aloe and myrrh are specifically known in medicine. We still use them today. Myrrh can stop bleeding, and aloe is used to speed up the healing process. They tried to treat the many superficial wounds caused by the scourging as best they could. The entire body was then covered with a fine linen cloth in order to deter contaminants and maybe insects or flies from the outside. Everything was done to assure his survival. Kirsten believes that the myrrh, combined with the heat from Jesus' feverish body, produced the image. Experiments show that myrrh can, in fact, create the sepia-colored picture or image on the cloth without having to add any miracles or attempts at supernatural explanations. Because the body was obviously in a comatose state, we can assume that it lay motionless for 12 or maybe even 24 hours beneath the cloth. That's more than enough time to produce the image. If Kirsten is right, instead of this, we have this. The only information the Gospels provide is that when the tomb was checked on Sunday morning, it was empty, except for some linen. I don't think that Jesus himself is behind this plan, but he resigned himself to his destiny. He didn't know how it would end, and whatever came his way, it would be fine. His prayer was also a wish. Father, if you are willing to take this cup away from me. And what kind of father wouldn't be touched by this prayer? The good news is that his prayer was actually heard, and he was truly saved. Kirsten's hypothesis of what the shroud is and what it signifies hasn't attracted a large following. Perhaps because it seems to offend everyone, skeptics and believers alike. Many of his claims can never be proven. But it's interesting to note that his theory mirrors the Muslim tradition, that Jesus survived his time on the cross and went on to live a long life, somewhere in the Far East. As for what happened to the piece of linen cloth and its ghostly image, most of those who believe the shroud is authentic think it was saved, hidden and handed down over the centuries. Along the way, it was seen by artists and became the model for all subsequent portraits of Christ. A man with long dark hair and a forked beard. The same image we see on the shroud. Time passed. The Crusades came and went. And the cloth eventually turned up in the possession of a crusader from a small town in northern France perfect relic for the new church in the ray. Unless, of course, the shroud is a forgery, 
and some anonymous craftsmen toiling away in the Middle Ages took Gothic art in a whole new direction, with a technique so subtle it still perplexes us today, despite all our scientific tools. Those tools won't get another crack at the shroud for a decade or two at least. After surviving yet another fire in 1992, the shroud has been packed away until the next exhibition, scheduled for the year 2025. That means we have years of debate ahead of us, each side with its own set of beliefs and, all too often, its own set of facts. This is not some medieval forgery. This is characteristic of Gothic art. It really is an extraordinary mystery. This is yet another dubious relic of Jesus. Lots of trained eyes have looked at the Shroud of Turin. It is the most studied artifact in human history. And still, we don't have all the answers. No amount of evidence will convince people it's not real if, they're, if they have a willingness to believe. If we were voting, I would vote for the Shroud of Turin to be authentic. It would be nice if it's genuine. I wish it were. It, I'm absolutely sure it's not. It is either the most remarkable forgery of all time or something very, very remarkable happened 2,000 years ago. The Shroud of Turin. Is it a painting? rubbing, a photograph, proof that Jesus didn't die on the cross, a witness to the resurrection. What we really have here is a mystery that may be destined to remain a mystery. It's one of Christendom's most precious relics. of herringbone linen, just over four meters long and one meter wide. The cloth isn't pretty to look at. It's been scarred, burned, stained and patched. But what makes it unusual is the image it bears on its surface. It's a shadow so faint it seems to disappear when you approach. Look at it from a distance, you can make out the ghostly silhouette of a man, seen from both the front the actual burial shroud of Jesus, or is it a fake? Every responsible and legitimate scientist who knows anything about the shroud accepts it as an as a artistic representation made during the 14th century. It is just out of character with uh, any art that one finds from the Middle Ages, Renaissance, anything like that. The shroud first came to light in the mid-14th century when it showed up at a small church in the French town of Lirey. If anyone knew where it came from, they never admitted it. New churches were actually, by canonical law, required at some point to have uh, relics. So we see entire churches being built uh, to house a crown of thorns or a, a holy shroud. Like the cross and the crown of thorns, Jesus' burial shroud was a familiar artifact to medieval Christians. Christians believed that on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. Although the Gospels never explicitly say this. They just tell us that the tomb was left empty except for one or more pieces of linen. Is it possible that the resurrection somehow produced an imprint on the burial cloth? 
most of those who believe the shroud is authentic think the answer is yes. The simplest answer is generally the correct one. And in this case, frankly, the simplest answer is this cloth wrapped this man's body and it's a, an artifact of that event. If the Shroud of Turin is actually Christ's burial cloth, it must have gone underground for the next 13 centuries. Because the next time it was heard of, the Shroud had turned up in the hands of a French crusader, recently returned from the Holy Land. All four Gospels mention it. The Bible tells us that after the crucifixion, Jesus was carried to a nearby tomb where he was prepared for burial. We're told this was done according to Jewish custom, but the Bible doesn't say what that custom was, except that Jesus was covered with a linen cloth. The Bible also says that large amounts of aloe and myrrh were brought in to anoint the body. Two days after the crucifixion came the transforming event that launched a new religion. Some people believe it's the burial shroud of Jesus. A forensically accurate imprint of the crucifixion, bearing Christ's image and stained with his blood. The only conclusion I can come to, this is the real thing. Others are just as certain it's not. The Shroud of Turin is the work of a confessed forger, period. Is it the real thing or a fake? Even modern science can't seem to find the definitive answer. It is either the most remarkable forgery of all time or something very, very remarkable happened 2,000 years ago. If it's a forgery, how was it done? And if it's the burial cloth of Jesus, does it confirm the faith or 